Hey, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today I am here with Benjamin Blake Speed Watkins. First of all, why is your name so long? Um, so that was a way to make my fa both sides of my family happy. So Blake comes from uh, my mother's side of the family and Speed comes from my father's side of the family. So my siblings also have four names as well. I'm serious, like that's probably the question that everybody's wondering. It's like, oh, yeah. why is his name so ridiculously long? Well, it Mainly, also makes me super Google searchable. Like it's yeah. not hard to find me online because I have such a unique name. What do you go by? Like what have people been? Yeah, I usually go by Ben. Just by Ben. So, uh, my mom calls me Benjamin when she's mad at me. Okay. <laughs> so I'm here with Benjamin. And so you are an atheist, but you grew up as a Christian. And you're actually here at the conference. You're going to be debating Trent Horn on whether or not God exists. So let's just have like a conversation about kind of your journey to atheism and kind of where you're at currently. Because you're an atheist, but you're not like a typical online atheist. That's maybe a nice way to put it. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that mm -hmm. as, as we go. But tell me, let's start by just... Give me your journey on why you, you know, came to the view that you're at now and how would you classify it? Because I know that, you know, the definition of atheism is another thing that you talk about. So Yes, very much so. Yes. Um, so I was raised in a conservative tradition in the South Carolina that is Protestant. very Protestant tradition that is very close to a Quaker tradition. So the uh, they refer to themselves as the truth and we don't go to a church, we go to someone's house and it's called a meeting. So that's how it's similar to a Quaker tradition in that it's like a society of friends. So the tradition um, just doesn't agree with the emphasis that's placed on a church, um, that it should be more, uh, more personal. And so people will sit around in that, in, it's about an hour long, do you like have food and eat and stuff or is it just? Well, no, so everyone sits down. Um, you'll usually sing about two hymns to start off. Um, then everyone will go around the room and say a prayer. You'll sing another hymn and then everyone will stand up and give a testimony based on uh, perhaps what they're reading. Um, on Wednesday nights, there was usually a set topic that would be what people would stand up and give a testimony on. And then you'd, um, have another prayer session where you would pass around uh, a, p a piece of bread and they usually had a glass of grape juice instead of wine. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, you know, representing Jesus' body. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, the wine representing his blood. And then you would close with another hymn. And then so after that. So was there a homily? So I don't know if I'm familiar. I don't think so. Was, it, was there like someone preaching on some passage or was no. it? No, so, but there would be someone that was leading it in the sense that they would say, okay, now we're moving to the next um, position. Um, sometimes the faith was called the two by twos because what we call, instead of having preachers, we had what were called workers. And so there are people that just give their entire life to this faith mm -hmm. and they just travel from house, to, they don't have any possessions other than what can fit in a suitcase and they just travel from house to house, from meeting to meeting all over the country all the time. And so if they were at a, a meeting, they would be the person that le led it. But other than that, there was no um, set um, theological curriculum. So that was one of the things that really led me to um, leave my faith in my early 20s because I had graduated college. I was dating someone who was not um, part of the faith who would later go on to be my wife. And so I was thinking, you know. Which, thank you again for letting him be here and participate in this Yes, thank in this you, honey. Debate. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and so. You've got a seven month old at home. And we that's do why have a seven month old. And like, she's she's just an amazing mother to our child. She just, she's handling this all in stride. I owe her quite a few favors after this. <laughs> <laughs> continue your story. Well, let me, I, I, when was the last time you've been to one of these meetings? So I went to one in North Carolina, I think in 2000, it was either 2018 or 2019 with Tyler Vela. Okay. And so. So fairly it, recently. Fairly recently. Um, the event was called The Mentionables. Mm. And so I got to meet um, a bunch of different people and debate Tyler Bell Vela mm -hmm. on the existence of God. And I thought it went really well. Um, it actually allowed me to also, prior to me starting my 
classical theist project. I did a, a serious presuppositionalist product, mm. uh, project. So diving into Van Til, um, kind of moving away from the, the internet version of mm -hmm. presuppositionalism, but trying to take, you know, understand it as best we can. And um, I was also really into Hegel at the time. And so okay. there was a lot of, I found a lot of interesting ways to interact presuppositional apologetics with Hegel. So let's go back to your journey. And so what was it like, what was the catalyst of like getting you to start to doubt your faith? And then well, so the catalyst was asking myself, quite, you know, how do I figure out personal finance at this point? What do I say about my faith at this point? These were just questions. Personal finance? Yeah, so I had graduated college. I was starting my life. Where am I on all this? Okay. Like how do I start, you know, my grown up life, okay. so to speak? Okay, okay. And so by doing that, um, I just started asking questions. Um, certain people would push back on certain things. Um, and so I just started reading, to be honest with you. And I found online communities. I found different books. Um, this was kind of at the beginning of podcasts. So I started listening to certain, so a couple podcasts. There was obviously many YouTube videos. And I just kind of started asking questions and I started doubting certain things. Um, and there was no real moment, I could say, in which things changed. Because, you know, I went through several phases. I went through um, a phase where I was like, well, am I going to, you know, be some other faith? Am mm -hmm. I going to be a deist? Am I an agnostic? Where, where do I fall on the spectrum? And I do remember one distinct um, event. Uh, I was wrestling with the problem of evil. And I was watching. Put me on a timeline. Where, where were you? Where was this? Or when was this? This was probably I was 24 at the time. So. So a couple years after doubting. After a couple years after doubting, and I was still struggling with the problem of evil, and I knew that there was this thing called the problem of divine hiddenness. Mm -hmm. But I just knew it was kind of one of those things I had shelved off to the side. And I was watching J.L. Schellenberg on Closer to Truth and watching him unpack the problem of divine hiddenness. And so and he I'll, used to be a Christian as well. He used to be a Christian as well. And so I felt like I remember really resonating with that interview. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, I'm having a really hard time figuring out this problem of evil thing. Like now I have this problem of hiddenness. And I do remember being frustrated in that point. And this, you know, in the back of my head going, I think I'm an atheist. Like, I think mm. this is like, I think this is the camp that I'm in. And so then uh, a couple years later, I discovered moral philosophy very deeply. And so philosophy of religion was kind of my entry point into philosophy, but, but, but moral philosophy is really what lit the fire in me. And when I lit did that- Lit the fire for philosophy or just like- For moral philosophy in particular. Okay. And, but that just made the problem of evil intractable at that point. Okay. And so- What do you mean? So it seemed to me that there were just uh, moral truths. So I was- in the realist camp, I found myself mm -hmm. as, and I was like, there's- Which is another thing that kind of makes you unique among atheists. Yeah, and well, so- Well, I mean, it, it depends on what, what group of atheists. For sure, for sure. There's, I definitely get a lot of pushback on it, but I was very convinced of this idea that, look, if we, if we took something like the point of view of the universe, everyone's value is equally the same. Mm -hmm. And that there, if we are moral agents, that we're going to have certain obligations to one another, and that this would, apply categorically to all moral agents. And so it just seemed to me that there was just these facts about the world that I just could not square with the idea of a perfect being. And so at this point I had um, rejected perfect being theism, but I still wasn't ready to give up religious concepts altogether. And so a few years after that is when I met Justin Schieber of uh, Reasonable Doubts at the time, and then he started the Real Atheology Project. And so, Why do I love him so much? <laughs> he's just such have a lovable guy. You, have you talked to him recently? I have talked to him, uh, really? at, at least on uh, social media. He recently got engaged. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He's doing well. Um, Is he doing any philosophy religion? Uh, not anything near like the level we are, but I think he's still reading in certain okay. areas. Okay. Um, but I'd have, to, I'd have to ask, it's been, yeah. I haven't talked to him in probably six months at okay. this point, so okay. it's been a while. But, uh, Sorry, to, I, I may have got you off track. No, 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 you're fine. Um, but it was the it was the, uh, the problem of evil that really just once I was really deep into moral philosophy, mm -hmm. I knew that I was at the point of no return mm -hmm. in at least one respect. But I wanted didn't want to give up the religious concepts just yet. So. 
being part of um, Justin Schieber's project when he brought me on to Real Atheology was um, really, really good for me because I was able to um, dive into what the philosophy of religion could really look like once we've rejected something like perfect being theism. So looking at other alternative models of religion that would be put forward some, by someone like Spinoza or Hegel or Einstein, kind of monistic versions of a religious reality um, that has objects that are worthy of our reverence. So um, I always say that the, the um, consideration that could change my mind, that could put me over into the other camp would be a, a really cogent religious experience. And in 2017, I was fortunate enough to witness a total solar eclipse. Now, I'm sure we've all seen pictures of a solar eclipse or a video in school or on mm -hmm. television. Let me just go ahead and tell you that everything you've seen about a so total solar eclipse is not in any way captured by the experience that you have by a sol total solar eclipse. Did you travel to go to this or were, were well, you just like in the right place, right time? Well, so traveled in the sense of I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. I now live in Norfolk, Virginia. I just traveled home for it. And so I was with my um, in-laws. I stayed okay. with them. And my nephew um, and brother-in-law flew down from New York City for it. So it was, uh, it was an event for us. Mm -hmm. It was a way for us to all get together as a family and experience something we hadn't experienced. Mm -hmm. It was an excuse to get together is really what we yeah. saw it. But yeah. we were in for so much more than what we thought. Because if I had seen that 500, 1,000 years ago, you know, and didn't know that what that was, I'd be like, there's a God, he's really <laughs> angry, and we are kind of screwed. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, was it, what was it like? I mean, the sky turned just the craziest shades of color. There was just, it was so many different um, colors that my camera couldn't capture. Every time I took a picture of it, the sky would just be blue. But the sky was very not, very much not very blue. Very not blue. What and color was it? It was all sorts of different colors. It's one of the, it's, it's an experience that I've never seen in any mm. medium of photography or video. Um, and I remember being frustrated. It sounds like a near-death experience. Yeah, trying to take pictures explaining. of it because there was just this black hole in the sky and a white ring that just was, yeah, billowing. <laughs> like, and I was going, wow. And I'd take a picture of it and it'd just be this white white dot on a blue sky. And I was like, this is not what this I'm looking at. <laughs> this is not what I'm looking at. And that was very, but, and I still remember my wife's gasp. Um, like, when, like it, when it fully when happened. It, yeah, because we were obviously looking at it with those safety glasses. Uh -huh. until, but once it becomes a total solar, you don't need the glasses. You took the glass off and you go, <gasps> whoa. This How is, long does that actually last? Is it, it just a couple It only lasted minutes? like a minute, uh, okay. maybe a minute and a half. That it's like fully in front of it. It's just it fully in front of it. Mm -hmm. And then it starts, the sun starts to peek and you back, put it back out. On. Um, but I remember thinking, I was like, this is, this is the sort of experience. Like if I were to have some sort of cogent experience that mm -hmm. involved some religious tradition, I don't know what religious tradition that might be, like that was, cause I'm, I'm here now via testimony yeah. trying to explain to you what it looked like, you know, saying like, you're just gonna have to take my word, you're just gonna have to see it, you're just gonna have to mm -hmm. experience it. It's, it's very hard to characterize. And so that's what I imagine um, many people's cogent religious experience are like. And I, I haven't had any religious experience like that. And so that certainly contributed to, to doubt so one question time. I've got on that is how would you integrate that into what you already sort of believe about the problem of evil and, and moral philosophy? So how would you integrate that experience with these other things you believe philosophically? Because um, would that just overwhelm th these other considerations? Or? Yeah, so it would just be an evidential chip that was just such an evidential chip that it would outweigh okay. those other considerations. Because um, right now that chip is the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And so I would need a sufficiently weightier chip on the other side. And I think that would look like a cogent religious experience. Okay. So we, we've also already talked about uh, one of the, well, I guess two, at least, the problem of evil and the problem of divine hiddenness that weigh in favor of atheism for you. What, what argument do you think that theists have that's actually like their best argument? So I actually think it's a teleological argument, um, uh, but it could sound misleading because it's the argument for moral agency. So the idea behind this is not that because there are moral truths, that counts in favor of theism. It's because there are moral agents in the world. That's the observation that is more probable given theism than naturalism. 
But why is that the case? And I think that's the case because um, theism implies the existence of at least one moral agent, God. Um, and so the probability of observing a moral agent given theism is one. So I can, we can say whatever we want to about naturalism. We can make whatever assumptions we want to, but it's never going to entail the existence of moral agents. And so um, certain other arguments we might think of this uh, in these sorts of way, we might want to say that consciousness mm -hmm. or life um, are evidence for theism over naturalism. But the naturalist does have an out for those by appealing to something like the weak anthropic principle. So the weak anthropic principle says that we have to, as part of our background data, be prepared to account for the fact that we are living conscious observers. That, see, so that's something that, that's the case regardless of whether naturalism is true or whether theism is true. So you can say that because we are conscious living observers, those considerations don't count in favor of naturalism or theism. However, the weak anthropic principle does not imply moral agents, does not imply that any observers in the universe are moral agents. And so that out just doesn't work for the argument for moral agency. And there's another rabbit hole of libertarian free will. So where do you sit on that? So I am a compatibilist about free will. Interesting. Um, I do not believe libertarian free will is compatible with de determinism, but I do believe that there is a concept of free will that is compatible with determinism. But I realize that that's a very controversial claim. And I think that if uh, our observation is moral agency and one of the assumptions that we're bringing to the table is libertarian free will, I think that's just another chip that falls in the theist's camp. Okay. Are there any other considerations, or is that is that like the main one? Well, uh, so that's the one I find the most right. persuasive. Right. Um, but I think there are what other about, chips. Like, what about the other arguments, like the Kalam or the contingency arguments, or like? Sure. So I say a teleological now is my favorite argument, but that wasn't always the case. Uh -huh. um, you know, if you had asked me this question three or four years ago, I would have almost certainly said the argument from contingency. Um, so I, I hate to keep bringing up Hegel. <laughs> um, but I do fashion myself as something of a Hegelian these days. So I'm very sympathetic to something like the principle of sufficient reason. Okay. So one of Hegel's main themes is the idea that the real is the rational and the rational is the real. And so the reason we can understand, what this means, the reason that we can understand the world is because the world is rational. We are rational because we are products of the world and that's why we can understand the world in and for itself. And I think that this is some version of the principle of sufficient reason. So being sympathetic to something like this, arguments from contingency, I just thought were super, super neat. Mm -hmm. um, Would you align with like Graham Oppie's view that there is some kind of necessary foundation or part of reality, but then he just doesn't go all the way to say that this necessary thing is God. He'll just say that it's- So I am sympathetic to that view. I'll, I'll go ahead and preface and say that I, I just don't know. These are, these are big cosmological yeah. questions. However, I am very uh, sympathetic with the Hegelian synthesis um, of this. If you this say piece. Hegel one more time, I'm I know. Slap I'm you. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but there is an idea that the um, universe is explained by prior states of the universe, and the entailment of all these successive um, uh, prior states of the universe um, is the, it entails the sufficient reason why the universe exists. And so, this is one of the big fears in contingency arguments is a necessary explanation collapsing the modal the distinction that we draw between necessity and contingency. So if the universe has a necessary um, explanation, well then the universe is necessary, not contingent, because a necessary um, explanation would entail the universe. It would entail that all these things. And so Hegel helps us find kind of the middle ground between this um, idea to say, no, we can say that, look, there are necessarily at least one contingent, of the set of contingent things, necessarily at least one contingent thing exists. So this is one way in which we can have an explanation of the universe that doesn't um, rule out a principle of sufficient reason, but also doesn't have that um, impalpable implication of kind of a modal fatalism where we just lose all the contingency because it does seem obvious that there's certain you know certain things could have been some ways rather than others and so i want to preserve that and so i'm most sympathetic to that view 
Um, but I might be I might be a little biased on it. Yeah, let's switch gears a little bit before we end the interview and just talk about uh, some of the differences between you and say the new atheist and like what what are what are some of the biggest differences that you think kind of yes. stick out in your mind? So we at a real atheology, a philosophy of religion podcast, we really want to distinguish ourselves from something like the new atheist and align ourselves more with something like contemporary analytic philosophy. So we really want to emphasize the clarity of concept um, and the rigor of argumentation and raising the level of discourse between atheists and theists because um, the wonderful thing about philosophy of religion is that it touches on so many interesting topics. You've got metaphysics, you've got ethics, you've got uh, philosophy of mind, uh, all kinds of just different areas in which you can dive into philosophy using the philosophy of religion. And so that's what we want to bring to our audience. We want to um, help them understand that they should care about the philosophy of religion, no matter what side of the aisle they're on. And it helps fill a, a niche area that we think is missing um, from what we call the skeptic community. So the skeptic community is full of podcasts that just want to kind of bat at low-hanging fruit, but our podcast is aimed at really engaging with the philosophical liter literature, the best philosophical mm -hmm. literature on both sides. Um, and, and I think we're kind of like aligned in this goal because I, I want to do the same thing from the Christian side. It's like, yes. I don't want to just stick with the lay apologists who are, you know, popularizers and, you know, there, there's debates that happen and these are all good and, and, and great, but. And this is going to be a running theme in mine and Trent Horn's debate tonight is raising the level of discourse and showing that there are um, intellectual sides on both sides of this debate that we, and hopefully we'll give everyone really good tools to help them in their journey, um, regardless of what side of the, the fence they might find themselves yeah, on. Yeah, that's so good. Is there anything that you'd like to leave with, the, with my audience? Because, uh, you know, this may be the first time, and uh, hopefully not the last time that they interact with you, but is there anything that you'd like to leave with uh, the Capturing Christianity audience? Well, yeah, so the, the best advice that I can give you is to... Feel free to look into the camera dispense, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> to dispense with things like burdens of justification and just let evidential chips fall where they may, and then proportion your belief to the evidence. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain from an honest pursuit of truth. All right, I think that's fair. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video. See you guys later.